How's it going, Gethin? How are you doing? Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, even. Yeah, uh, I suppose it's, it's <laughs> nice to meet you. I, and you guys. Hi, Sophie. Hello. Hi, Sophie. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How's everyone? Doing well. Good. It's nice to meet you all. It's really cool that you guys uh, wanted to come hang out for a bit. This is going to be a really good time. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, definitely. I like your background, sir. Thank you very much. So it would be kind of appropriate for today. <laughs> much better than the oh, wall. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to ask the classic question now, somebody who's not in America. What time is it over there? Uh, it's just before 7 a.m. Oh, fun. It's, it's a little early, uh, but... <laughs> do you usually start work at uh, early or...? Uh, I do personally, yeah. Justin and I do usually at, well, he starts at six and I'll start at seven. Um, yeah, I try, I try to get in for about 6.30 every morning as well. I, I was I was in at 6.30 this morning. I opened a country park on my way into the office. So, oh, sure. Uh, so instead of going to the office, I did that and came back home to work the day. But yeah, that's my, uh, that's my usual routine. Cool. Bunch of early birds. <laughs> yeah, I'd be better if it was 6, uh, 7 a.m. here, I've got to be honest. <laughs> My brain, my brain functions better at that time of day. Yeah. Is that how it is for you as well, Sophie? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I'm currently working as like um, a lecturer in the university, so early mornings is kind of my time to kind of you know do all of my fun research stuff, and then the rest of the day in the afternoon is kind of dealing with students and inquiries and things like that. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, especially when we're, we're applying herbicide, I, I just kept, couldn't get my head around starting work later in the day. I find that mm -hmm. if I get well, everything I get done before lunch is twice as much as, as there is in the afternoon. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's much more effective. Things tend to go better in the morning as well. Things go wrong in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> well, looks like. It's getting closer to that time, so people are going to be showing up soon. Um, let's see. Did both of you have some time to take a look at some of those prompts that I sent over? Yeah, sure. They're, they're fairly standard sort of stuff for us. That's the. Um, it's because the project's been going for so long. I, I could ramble on for hours and hours and hours. So you'd have to stop us and, and oh. uh, read me in a bit. Perfect. Well, I might be counting on you then. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, great. Um, I'll mention this again later, but I mean, really, the there is like a little bit of structure to this thing, but the overall goal is really just to for everyone to you know talk and meet and just kind of nerd out a bit about Japanese knotweed and you know hear from people from the UK and for you to hear from us and you know think uh i think the format should be really good because sophie and i have done a few of these before for different people and different groups and stuff and i think the best bit always comes from the round table discussions at the end yeah um, definitely it's it's one of the things that i always suggest it's like let's, let's, don't bother with the presentations just do the discussions at the end it's much mm -hmm. better so, i'm glad you think so because that's going to be kind of the whole focus there's not really much to present um so Good. Glad to hear that. I know there will be a few folks who will be late um, a bit, but it should be just fine. And it looks like we have some new faces. Um, Neil and Dallas, how are you doing this morning? Good. Good morning, everyone. Good. Good. Hi, everybody. Joining you from Minnesota. Yep, same here. So I'm one of Roger Becker's colleagues. We work on knotweed, and of course, Dallas is our master's student getting her master's on knotweed. So, uh, uh, 
right. Well, we're going to give it a few minutes um, to let people file in. Um, but we'll get started momentarily. It's Roger. Good morning, Roger. There. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Getting there. Morning. Joe, did Laura commit or was she not able to? Yeah, she's going to show up. She's one of those people that's going to be a little bit late. She had to okay. handle some personal stuff right away in the morning, but she'll show up. Understandable. I was gonna say wait for monica if she's not no i don't see her if we yeah once monica comes in or was she gonna be late as well not to my knowledge okay yeah i wait a few more minutes for her i'll keep an eye on emails okay cool and i think alan smith is coming too isn't he roger i, I don't know or not. i don't <laughs> I believe so. I, I spoke to him. I sent him the link to this. Um, he was interested as well. So I'm hoping he'll show up soon too. Dallas, you still have the best knot we. <laughs> Thank you. I like Sophie's background too. It's nice to see I'm not the only one with knot weed behind me. That's true. There's, there's good knot weed there. Yeah, there's some knot weed there. Yeah, I really like your background. I thought I'd have like a picture of like some native woodland or well, native woodland with some uh, nice invaders in there in the background. Uh -huh. After a poor game, I think I have to go for some treatments or something. Joe, in the interest of time, do you want to just get started? I'll try to track down Monica and uh, listen to the background here. Okay, perfect. Will do. Um, oh, it looks like Dan is joining as well. Perfect. All right. Well, I guess we're going to get started. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's very... Uh, I'm, grateful for everyone who showed up. Um, today we're just going to be kind of doing a roundtable discussion on Japanese knotweed. Um, it's kind of low-key. There's no real structure, but we are recording this to use later in the live webinar that we'll be doing um, in a couple weeks from today. So if at some point maybe somebody has something to say that's, you know, like really good, I might ask you to repeat it just in case it's um if you don't say it like the right way you wanted to say it um so we can use that later um but again it's no pressure um just here to have a good time and talk about that um so i guess we should just kind of get right into it and i think we should all go around and do some quick introductions uh just to get us familiar with each other um, you can refer to one of those prompts that I sent in the email with the link to the meeting. Um, who are you and how did your work and research with Natweed begin? Uh, I'll go first. Um, my name is Joe Tillotson. I am a conservation technician with Ramsey County Soil and Water Division. Um, my work with Natweed began last summer um, by visiting and following up with new and old sites with Japanese knotweed and treating them with smothering methods. Um, that was really interesting. That definitely uh, went to lots of different parks and public property, but also private landowners as well. Um, and kind of building a relationship with them to then follow up later in the fall with herbicide treatments was pretty successful. So that was. That's me. I guess we'll just move down the list. Um, Gethin, would you mind uh, 
telling us a little bit about yourself? No, not at all. Uh, morning, I'm Gethin Bowes. I've been employed as an invasive species officer for Caffili Council in South Wales since 2005. Um, Caffili is a, a relatively small county in the south, southeast corner of Wales, it covers about 28,000 hectares, um, sort of former coal field sites, so quite industrial in places. Uh, population of about 180,000, maybe a bit more. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that's where we're, we're based. Um, most of my work on, on invasive species has been uh, around South Wales, around the South Wales Valleys. Uh, first got involved in invasive species treatments when I first left university back in 98. Uh, we were treating Japanese knotweed pretty badly at the time, uh, working to some specifications that were put out by uh, a sort of governmental body at the time. We were using uh, sort of different herbicides at different times of the year with limited success. Um, that sort of extended into the early 2000s, again, working to sort of quite detailed specifications that were, to my mind, not, not necessarily correct. Uh, and I took the job with Caffili in 2005 as their invasive species officer, targeting the, the, the three most problematic invasives for us, uh, which are Japanese knotweed, which is far and away the, the biggest issue, uh, Himalayan balsam to a, to a lesser degree, and, and giant hogweed on our uh, river catchments. It's very little sort of terrestrial stuff uh, that, that tends to be on our riparian areas, really. Um, we've got in excess of a million square meters of Japanese knotweed as a county in, in Caffili. Um, so that, that, like I say, that's our, our primary focus. The, the initial project, uh, the 2005 to 2008, was just covering Caffili County. Um, and then that's extended uh, up until where we are today, where we're working in partnership with eight other local authority areas. Uh, and that covers the sort of whole of South East Wales now, uh, down into Cardiff, Newport, uh, Monmouthshire. So it's quite a big area now. Um, and uh, again, not, not huge sums of money invested into the projects, but, but enough that we are seeing, seeing some sort of results. Um, so yeah, uh, sort of three main elements of the projects that we cover. So it's treatment, uh, and monitoring of that treatment uh, survey, and then advice and guidance to public developers, other sprayers, uh, whoever it might be. Uh, and that's probably one of the bigger areas of the project. Um, I think that probably about covers it really in a, <laughs> in a snapshot, but yeah, I could go on for ages. But yeah, there's, there's uh, like I said, the, the project's evolved quite a lot over the over the, the, the time period since 2005. Uh, and I'd like to think we've, we've developed quite a bit since then as well. So. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. That's great. Um, let's see. Next. For me, the next up is Sophie. Hello. Um, yeah, my name's Sophie. Um, I first got into researching Japanese knotweed when I started my PhD, which was in 2017. Um, so my PhD was based at Swansea University, and it was basically a continuation of Dan Jones's work. Um, and I was looking specifically at the effects of knotweed management methods, so the impacts of how we manage Japanese knotweed, and then methods for long-term restoration after you manage to treat the knotweed somehow. Um, so a big bulk of my work was uh, conducting restoration trials, testing different restoration methods after you control Japanese knotweed, to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, and then I did a lot of work around life cycle assessment for looking at the environmental impacts of different knotweed management methods. Um, a lot of soil analysis, looking at the physical impacts on the soil and impacts to the soil microbiome. So I did some eDNA metabarcoding to do with that and then long-term analysis of the plant community and, and diversity as well. Um, so, yep, ever since 2017, I've been kind of just plowing away looking at Japanese knotweed and the impacts of that. Perfect. Sounds good as well. Um, Dallas, would you mind talking a bit about your research and your master? Oh, sure, yeah, I wasn't really prepared, but. Oh. Um, yeah, so I'm a master's student, uh, obviously, at the University of Minnesota, and I have been studying knotweed since I started in the summer of 2019. So it's been a few years now. I'm hoping to finish up in the next couple of months. And my research is mainly looking at the genetic diversity and population structure of knotweed, specifically in Minnesota. And then I've also had a research project looking at the cold hardiness of rhizomes of knotweed for both the species and the hybrid. Cool. Very cool. Let's go. Neil. 
Yeah, hi everyone, Neil Anderson. I'm on the faculty at the University of Minnesota. Worked with Roger for many years, since 1989, when we started first working on invasive purple loosestrife for Lithrum salicaria here in, uh, in Minnesota, uh, and have worked on many invasive ornamentals since that time. And that's because my research program focuses on ornamental breeding and genetics, uh, and ornamentals seem to be the primary source of invasives, uh, invasive plants at least. Um, and uh, so it's been a, a fruitful <laughs> series of decades that, uh, that we've been working on it. Uh, and of course, uh, I've had a long interest in knotweed having grown up with it as a ornamental herbaceous perennial um, uh, across North America and just interest in its evolution. And so Alan and I and, and Roger uh, advise Dallas and Kevin Yu is uh, another student working on knotweed with us. He's getting his PhD. <clears throat> I don't think he's gonna be with us this morning. Um, and so basically, you know, I, I work along with uh, the efforts with genotyping and phenotyping uh, the knotweed populations. Perfect, thank you. Uh, this will go uh, Daniel Jones next, that's all right. I've been having a couple of issues with sound today. Um, yeah, my name's Dan Jones. Um, I'm a researcher at Swansea University and I've also got a business um, that looks to sort of control and manage um, invasive plant species more effectively and, and sustainably. Um, I work with Gethin from 2012. He was the one that showed me how to spray um, <laughs> three metre tall knotweed plants after I'd been trained spraying um, stuff growing on pavements and things like that. Um, so that was where I met Gethin. And then obviously um, I've, I've been closely involved with Sophie's work as that's developed over the last four or five years. So yeah, that's, that's currently where I'm up to with everything. Great. And uh, let's go, oh, and last but not least, uh, Roger. Hi, I'm Roger Becker. I'm an extension research appointment. Extension is in the US is a federal uh, state relation, um, it's a state federal funded effort to have adult education, basically outreach arms of the universities. So it's a very uh, applied aspect in my case, but I also re am a researcher. I did time at Iowa State uh, in a, in a, as a weed scientist. And one of the first things I, I found out was we had Japanese knotweed running amok in the late seventies in Iowa. You'd always get these great big plants shipped in from farmstead gardens and things like that. And it was it was just quite an interesting plan. They've watched over the decades the, with interest, the Bailey stories from England, uh, of this thing running amok through, through the UK. And, um, and we've always, so it's always been on the periphery here. And in recent years, maybe a recent decade, it's been making its move, so to speak, in the Midwest, where it's always been around. You always get these oddball samples in, but it's it's starting to run through the riparian areas and then through other areas in Minnesota and, and the upper Midwest. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in control. We, we've been watching what you guys have been doing in England, trying to get the hints as to control and things. I also do, we do, excuse me, biocontrol with Neil. Uh, I do herbicides because of my my applied job uh, is very much herbicide oriented. So we're just we're, one of the things we're doing recently is looking at a herbicide screen because um, a lot of stuff has been done. Some of the most interesting work is your work, uh, Daniel, from uh, England. One of the most exhaustive studies I've ever seen on on herbicide interactions with not wheat. So uh, we're trying to just see what the revisit, just to make sure we're not missing some clues, uh, key things that might work in the US as far as the herbicides we have available. And that's one of the things I'm doing on this project. Excellent. Um, let's see. And then we also have Justin Townsend on the Zoom. Uh, he's a coworker of mine. We work pretty closely together on uh, invasive species treatments more than just Japanese knotweed, but he is very familiar with treatment methods and things of that nature. Um, well, thank you everybody for those great introductions. I guess now, if anyone had any really burning questions for somebody, now would be a really good time to uh, open the floor. But if not, 
I have some more questions that we can lean on to keep things moving. I just thought I'd give anybody the opportunity now if they want one. suppose not. Um, I guess one thing for me, at least, I'd really love to hear about uh, more people's work and research currently um, in greater detail. Um, so I don't know, I think we should use this time to really, you know, dig deep and uh, really show off your stuff if uh, you got it. Um, Geth and I know that you uh, have plenty to say. Um, whatever you'd like to share, please do. I can see that smile, Dan Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Dan's on the end of lots of my not weed related ranting. So, and I think I cop for a fair bit of his as well. So it's interesting that we both sat quietly and didn't say anything at all for a minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I touched on it briefly in my introduction. Uh, we've, we've been at Japanese not weed treatment for a, for a considerable amount of time in, in Southeast Wales, particularly. Uh, when I came to, to post in 2005, um, we, there was lots of, I, I don't know whether it was misinformation, Dan, or just there wasn't a lot of information. And, and there was a couple of people that had sort of been around not weed treatment for quite a long time that were being pushed forward by well, sort of colleagues within other local authorities. Um, and, it, and nobody was really doing anything to, to, nobody was really doing anything on any sort of scale, really. And, and what we were doing wasn't particularly effective because we were treating it at the wrong times of the year. We were applying herbicides too early in the spring and that sort of stuff. So, so when I came to post in 2005 with Kefili, there was an element of, of sort of pinning down a, a, a decent methodology, which, to be fair to one of my colleagues in a neighbouring local authority area, uh, he had some some sort of firm ideas on late season applications of glyphosate at that stage uh, when nobody else was really pushing that forward as a, as a methodology for, for effective treatment. So we, we sort of trialed different herbicide products at, at different times and, uh, and it quickly became apparent to us that the uh, late season app or an application of glyphosate based herbicide between flowering and senescence was, was our uh, most effective tool, if you like, and our, our uh, most cost effective in terms of our time, uh, the amount of herbicides we were using. So that's where we sort of, like I say, we tried lots of other stuff, but but quickly that became apparent. And like when you were talking about breakthroughs and stuff in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, our biggest breakthrough with Notweed, I think that was probably it. And it, it isn't relatively recently, which, you know, it's a long time ago. And I think where we've probably reached perhaps quicker than, than some of our neighbouring authorities in, in, in Wales and, and even in the UK. Uh, we sort of know what works, but we just haven't got the resource to be able to, to push that out to a, a bigger scale. Really. Uh, and that's like I say, we've sort of stretched that window of opportunity for applying that herbicide. And we now treat probably between the plant being fully developed, uh, probably late June, June, early July for us. And we spray right the way through into November. Um, I'm not sure how that's different to, to you guys in terms of seasonality uh, out there, but um, like I say, we, we tend to get um, sort of warm, wet autumns, if you like, and it tends to be that, that we don't tend to get a frost really until sort of mid-November in, in, in South Wales. Uh, and I know this year we had green not weed into quite late into November. Um, so that, that's where the bulk of our sort of work is, if you like. And then we've we've refined our treatment methods uh, in terms of the equipment we use. Uh, we've got that narrowed down to, to some useful sort of kit in terms of the, the practicalities of the job. Uh, and like I say, our biggest constraint really is the fact that we just haven't got the resource in terms of labour, uh, manpower to be able to tackle bigger areas really. All right. Well, I'm sorry Can to you... hear about your uh, your staff shortages and <laughs> things like that. I think Gethin does himself a bit of a disservice, to be perfectly honest, because, I mean, considering it is basically him on his own, um, how many how many hectares a year do you treat? Is it like 50? Yeah, it's, it's probably a bit more than that, because we're, we're on about 1,800 sites, so and that they're at various stages of the treatment process. They wouldn't all be being treated, but... Uh, yeah, and, and I think the kind of key thing, kind of where Gethin's kind of experience kind of links with the research is, I mean, obviously I said, you know, um, he was the one that kind of got me spraying knotweed in a practical way, because I mean, when you've got a leaf surface area of 20 square metres per metre of ground, 
you know, what you're spraying there isn't the same as when you calibrate your knapsack for sort of spraying like dandelions or daisies on the pavement, you know? So, I mean, I think the scale component of this is really important. And, I, you know, just the size of the plant, um, the testing that we did had to be scale appropriate as well. So all, all of the experiments that I did, we did them in, what well, I did them in 15 by 15 metre plots. And that was to make sure that we, we got reliable data because Gethin was kind of saying to me, you know, we can use some of these herbicides away from water, you know, the synthetic organ based product. But, you know, when it actually comes down to it, the glyphosate has got to be tested scale appropriately because some of these other products are maybe being over applied, applied using some quite, I think dodgy would be the word in terms of the methods that they were using, um, you know, illegal basically. Um, and what we needed to have was a robust scale appropriate data set over a number of years as well, because one of the key things that we were finding, certainly with the synthetic orgs in success stories, was they would um, look at the knotweed and they'd treat and then evaluate in the same year. Well, of course, the knotweed, when you treat it effectively with glyphosate, the, the symptomology doesn't really appear until you don't see any above ground growth in, the, in subsequent growing seasons. So it was kind of, that was the kind of aim, the overall aim of the, the, the kind of experiments. And it just so happens that Gethin's quite unique in that he doesn't have a commercial, um, he doesn't have a commercial kind of stake in any of these particular methods, unlike most operators in the UK. So he doesn't make any more money <laughs> if he's treating the knotweed three or four times a year. In fact, for him, it's beneficial if he's treating it fewer times a year, using the right stuff at the right time. So I think that's where the two of us kind of realized that, you know, what I was getting in terms of data matched up quite closely with what he was finding uh, on a practical level. And I mean, I'm just doing the new knotweed manual with um, Lois Child and Gethin's um, one of the case studies in there. But I mean, if you think about some of the methods that were, were, were recommended for knotweed management, things like, you know, stem injection does work very well. But I mean, when you consider that the labor component is probably eight times greater than what you need for, for spraying off the knotweed, well, that restricts it on a spatial level. You know, you, you can't, with, with available funds, resources, everything else, Gethin wouldn't be able to treat this much knotweed if he was using stem injection. If it was only synthetic orgs in herbicides that worked on knotweed, well, you wouldn't be able to manage it near water. So it's all kind of come together quite neatly from a, a kind of practical and an academic level. Um, and yeah, that's, that's why Gethin's project works so well, is that he is using these evidence-based methods that can be deployed at scale over a long period of time by one person. Like, you know, it doesn't, although Gethin could benefit from probably several people helping him, um, he wouldn't be able to achieve this much without, if it was a far more laborious um, control method that needed to be applied. So I think that, by, the, but by the same token, then everything that, that we sort of knew anecdotally, Dan Science backed up for us. So it, it, that, that's where the relationship works for, for us in terms of um, everything I drove around and showed Dan. Anecdotally, Dan, this is what I think, Dan. This, and, and like I said, from that experience, we, you know, we, knew, we knew that, sort of knew what Dan's results might look like before they came out, which um, I'm pleased to say <laughs> bore, bore witness to the fact that, that what we've been doing was, was right for a number of years on a, like I say, on a landscape scale, really. I mean, without, and sort of, I think Sophie needs to, to pick up and take over from this, otherwise we'll just talk about herbicides all afternoon. But I think one of the key things that, because my background is as an ecologist, and I think when I started all of this, I thought, you know, if you cover the knotweed up, if you cut it down, you'll get good control results. You know, I, I, off the record, I'd probably have said maybe um, people could try harder to get rid of it. Um, but once you actually start working with it, you realize that things like cutting, you know, they're again, very labor intensive covering, you know, they've, they've, they've got um, enormous CO2 emissions associated with their application. There's your plastic waste, waste issues that Sophie will discuss. Um, and, and just sort of, I don't know, like the, the, the kind of get into a sort of an effective way of managing knotweed. Um, using the right tools is really difficult and and I think you know with 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 the restriction in herbicide use when I started this you could use 2,4-D in the water you could use uh, picklerum I think you 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 folks have still got it registered for use 
you know, these products aren't available in the same way as what they were when I started 10 years ago. Um, and I think coming back to the, the, the Tordon is, is the product name for the pickle room that I used. Um, what was really interesting about that was it had a lot of ecologists really didn't like its application. Um, but it's actually a really effective tool within knotweed management to knock back the, the knotweed growth and to allow recovery because it's a selective herbicide to allow recovery of your grass sward and then establishment of trees. And a lot of the ecologists that come down to the site say, oh, well, what, what was that treatment? And you just say, well, that's, that's tooled on. And they're like, oh no, but that, that, that kills all the trees. But this comes back to this kind of scale um, appropriate evaluation of these different treatment methods you know, over a long period of time, it allows you to demonstrate what works, what doesn't, and, and, and helps you to explain to people, you know, why, why certain things work and others don't. So I think that, and I think, you know, Sophie and I's PhD supervisor has been very good at kind of linking the kind of practical elements of this back to the kind of theoretical understanding of it, so we can extrapolate to other species and other systems as well. Yeah, this feels like a good time for me to jump on, actually. Um, as I mentioned earlier, part of my research during my PhD was to kind of assess the impacts um, of different treatment methods for Japanese knotweed. Um, and me and Dan Jones actually conducted a life cycle assessment to try and compare the different impacts of all these different um, treatments. And yeah, I think it was one of those kind of breakthrough moments in my PhD, definitely, just because it does start to you know get you thinking of how we really need to start considering the costs and the, benef the benefits of knotweed management and how does that tie in with the efficacy of all these different management methods. Um, so, you know, as Dan's kind of alluded to, not all management methods are equal, but both in terms of how effective they are at actually managing Japanese knotweed, but also their wider impacts as well. And I don't know about you guys, but definitely in the UK, especially with, you know, increasing concern around the climate um, emergency and things like that, we do get to have some negative um, maybe public perceptions of different treatment methods for Japanese knotweed and herbicides in general on a wider scale. Um, but I think what we need to do is kind of tackle this in an objective way and have some objective thinking around what goals we want to achieve in invasive plant management. And why does knotweed management fit into this wider climate emergency? Um, especially when we're thinking of things like, you know, carbon emissions um, and impacts to human health as well. Um, and you know, trying to figure out whether the cure is actually worse than the disease, um, what happens in that case, or whether there's any kind of place in knotweed management for less effective methods if they are less damaging to human health and the environment. Um, and yeah, and all of this kind of needs empirical evidence to kind of make some decisions around the cost versus the benefits of knotweed management. And um, one of the main findings of my research was actually that alternative, I'm saying alternative as in, um, management methods that, are, that aren't chemical based really. Um, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. Um, a lot of the time, if you consider all of the impacts across an entire life cycle of a given product or process, the, the impacts do add up. Um, so I think we do definitely need to kind of reevaluate what we mean when we're talking about green alternatives or you know things that aren't just chemical based. Um, and that needs to be based on whether they work or not, first of all, but then also at their actual impacts over their entire life cycles, so from production to end of life. Sophie, can you talk a little bit more about the smothering? The uh, Dan, I think, mentioned the CO2 emissions from smothering. Yeah, so um, without trying to, I'm not, I can't go into too much detail because one of the requirements of life cycle assessment is that I can't kind of, um, we need um a peer review. So while it's while I'm working on publishing it, I can't kind of divulge any massive amounts of detail about it. Um, but in the LCA, we did compare physical methods to chemical methods. And what we found what that was really interesting actually is in terms of carbon emissions, it takes a lot to make geomembrane textiles. It takes a lot to kind of if you're making you know um, um, plastic sheets to cover Japanese knotweed, that's a lot of plastic you're putting into the environment, and that's a lot of CO2 emissions and you know a lot of other pollution that goes into actually extruding the plastic and creating these products in the first place. Um, one of the limitations actually of my LCA is that I haven't been able to account for a lot of the kind of post application emissions or pollution. So things like, you know, what happens when the plastic degrades in the environment and you release microplastics out into the soil and things like that. Um, but just from the kind of um, production phase of the LCA, 
it's actually quite surprising how much CO2 gets emitted from using these physical management methods compared to other chemical methods. So it's, it's interesting, to thank you. About. Yeah. Yeah, that is really interesting. Oh, go ahead, Roger. Well, I just remember uh, we had our, uh, the International Bio Control or Symposium of Bio Control of Weeds group meets every three years and they're in, um, near Montpellier in uh, 2011. And the Brits at that time were showing, uh, and I, I apologize if this UK, Wales, Brit, I'm, I mean, all you guys, <laughs> but regardless, they were showing a, um, the, the matting at that time, uh, they didn't have bio control. This is a bio control group. And it was, uh, that just wasn't happening in Europe at that time. And they, they did have quite a few images of this covering. And uh, it was just, it was a massive effort and it, it um, would work, um, but it took a long time. The soils are both anaerobic and all that kind of stuff. So it's just interesting to see the efforts that they're putting into it. And, uh, the evolution of things that you might be able to look at to do in addition to that. I mean, it still has a place, but it does, it does there is no free lunch is what I always say. All these options for control have, have costs. And that's yeah. something that's very interesting from what you're describing. Yeah, definitely, I agree. I mean, everything has its own place, doesn't it? And, and what type of management method you use is obviously going to depend on what your goals are, what kind of area you're trying to manage and, you know, all sorts of different criteria. Um, but if we're talking about managing Japanese nutweed on a landscape scale, I don't, you know, some options are clearly not practical, are they? Um, and then it comes down to, you know, what is your goal and does the cure actually do more damage than the actual disease? Um, yeah. And uh, Geth, and I was interested in your comments on Roundup in the fall. Round, I, I worked for Monsanto for a while in the 80s. Uh, before I came back to the public sector side. And we were doing all the roundup development glyphosate at that time in other markets. We still, they were still charging $80 an acre, which would be, I don't know what, the, it's a lot of money. because <laughs> And it was only used in high value crops at that time. But then then everything changed, as you all know. But, um, but it doesn't translocate that well. And it just moves along with generally the carbohydrates and so forth. And uh, what you described with all applications has always been in the back of my mind. We're actually looking at some carbohydrate characterization of, of the trend, uh, the flow up and down and which gives you an indication of where the herbicides might be a little more effective but it follows some other herbaceous plants that we've looked at in forage management they have the same kind of carbohydrate cycling and I, it was interesting in your describing the thing I don't know is this plant is so huge it's just a huge herbaceous plant so do those same kind of things apply and for us in the fall season it's flowering really late in the season for this kind of a climate that we have. It just gets the flowering going and then we get these hard frosts. And uh, I, it would be interesting to see with that kind of a structure, if those, those things kind of herbicide metabolism things happen. It's just one of the biggest herbaceous plants we've ever dealt with. We just don't have that much experience in looking at the uh, translocation and stuff yet at this, this side. I think, Roger, we get good translocation from when the plant is fully developed. And I think it's quite small margins between that fully developed sort of period and the onset of flowering, I reckon, is probably somewhere between, I don't know, what would you say, down four or five weeks, perhaps, between fully developed and the onset of flowering being obvious? Yeah. Something like that. Uh, and I think the results are, are, are pretty good from anywhere in that, that window of treatment, really. But like you say, it, uh, my first experience of it was when we were we were... Uh, we were carrying out three sprays a year, so it was one early spring, one sort of mid-season and another one late on. Uh, we had a really grizzled old farmer that worked with us and he was absolutely, every time we went out to do the first applications, he was uh, he was furious. It's got a rhizome, it needs spraying later in the season. And he was just, this is wrong, it's completely wrong, we're doing it completely wrong. It was like, that's what they want, that's what we've got to do. Nope, 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 nope. And he just, he was, ah, oh, it was constant. It was eight hours of him moaning that we were doing it completely wrong all the time. So that was where my first, uh, that, that was where I was first sort of uh, started to think about it, if you like, and um, come, come round to the way of thinking that we should be looking at the, at the plant, translocating it round itself as well. And like I say, it was that 
uh, that was back early, sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then, let's say, when I took the job with Confili, that was the, that was one of the things that uh, a colleague was 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 getting really good results on with the limited budget and limited resources he had available to him. Uh, was that targeted application from they were looking from sort of uh, over here that's August September and and sort of into October if weather was permitting. From a kind of I I don't know what what the word would be biochemical kind of point of view. So yeah, we I think we probably have got um, a longer application window. Um, I would imagine that in Minnesota you probably are going to have um, a more restricted one, but. The, the paper we did in 2018 was this four stage model. So early in the growing season, you've got the resources going up from the rhizome into the above ground parts of the plant. Um, as the growth stabilizes in sort of, I don't know, uh, May, June in the UK, depending on the weather, um, resources captured within the, the above ground parts of the plant um, fuel further secondary growth within the above ground parts of the plant, but then resources have begin to go get get sequestered down into this into the root system so we're thinking now um that actually sort of june july depending on where you're spraying the knotweed you know depending on altitude um that you can probably get away with an earlier application than we thought previously because actually more of the resources of you know thinking back to this so source sink um concept you know there's actually quite a lot of resource being drawn down at that point and you can actually get away when when you're managing as much as geth is you can kind of get away with that earlier spray and still get good results. In terms of then what happens to the glyphosate once it's in, in the actual plant. So as, as you get the resources drawn down more strongly over time towards senescence, because it's extracted more and more, um, more rapidly towards the end of the growing season, um, you do get more glyphosate per spray down into the root system proportionately when you've got that higher flux of photosynthate, like later in the growing season. Once the, 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 and this is in the 2018 paper I did, because the glyphosate isn't acting at the whole plant level in, in your classical dose response um, way. So in small plants, it's got a whole range of different um, uh, symptomology um, and ways that it destroys plant growth. In these big rhizome forming species, what we're really talking about is not, it's a bit like, I don't know whether you get it in America, but whack-a-mole. Um, it's the game that you play at the fairground and you've got to bash the mole when, and it pops its head up. And that's effectively what all of these little rhizomes are like. They're like this big bud bank underneath, underneath the ground. And as the glyphosates suck down into an active growing point, which is where the stem's currently growing out of, it gets locked in there and then it destroys the cells in that meristem, but doesn't move, as, as, as you said, you know, it doesn't move far laterally or vertically within the rhizome system, which is why we always say, you know, don't use, um, don't dig up knotweed once you've controlled it effectively with glyphosate, because you'll break up the rhizome system and release dormant meristems, um, growing points, buds on that, on that rhizome and they'll just be reactivated. It, it kind of reinvigorates growth. But coming back to the original point, yeah, you've got an enormous plant with enormous biomass per, per unit um, area. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the questions that was kind of quite important to me when I started the PhD, you know, 10 litres per hectare of glyphosate sounds, or 360 grams acid, acid um, AI per, per, per hectare. You know, that is quite a lot of herbicide. But when you think that you're applying that to much smaller plants in certain settings, like big dandelions and things like this, or you know other plants, yeah, it kills them. But what are the chances of it actually killing the knotweed plant? Aside from any of the sort of considerations around how the glyphosate's translocated following application in the plant, I mean, you'd have to apply a huge amount of glyphosate to the knotweed plant to kill it. And what we also found, and without going off on one completely, is that so. When you apply 3.6 kilos per hectare as a foliar application, which is what Gethin does as a standard method, right? You get really good results. If you apply 85 kilograms, so a lot more, and you individually apply that to each of the stems, you cut them, pour that herbicide directly into the stem cavity, the control is worse. So actually, the you've 
coming back to the biology of it, you've got to work with the biology of the system, so understanding the rise and forming plant. But then you've also got to think about how does the glyphosate interact in that rhizome system and like over application um, to, to, to certain um, stems, it doesn't result in better kill of the rhizome system or anything like that. So actually what we're talking about is kind of knocking out the growing points on that, you know, in the first 10, 20 centimetres of the soil um, and, and, and preventing or minimising growth in subsequent growing seasons to the point that, you know, either native plants begin to recolonize that or you know where Sophie's work picks up on that is can we improve um, that that transition from a not weed dominated habitat into something that's going to have some you know benefit in terms of native biodiversity I yeah it's it's it, it is it's really interesting because yeah it, it's not we're not talking about a little plant it's a, it's a giant isn't it and yeah, the way that the herbicides, like when you put, I, I did some testing for a company this year and I put a lot of synthetic orgs in herbicide onto the knotweed. And yeah, that was early in the growing season. By the end of the growing season, it didn't really look any different than when I had applied it earlier in the growing season. The level of recovery and resilience within the plant is just enormous. It's an absolute beast. And yeah, what we're talking about is kind of, with the glyphosate is knocking out the growing points for a sufficiently long time that you get you know new plants kind of moving in there but you sort of and then mopping up any new growth but you've kind of got to accept that that knotweed rhizome is going to be you know alive below ground for decades potentially i'm curious when does when does the knotweed flower uh, what are the phenological cues as to when the carbohydrates might be shifting, I guess, and doing more accumulation in the rhizomes versus more structure building up above? Um, I, if, if I can share a screen, I'm just sure. um, getting um, the, the kind of big paper up now. Um, but yeah, so it was actually based on work undertaken by Monsanto. Um, a number of years ago, it was kind of an integration of that with um, work that we've done and, and others have done as well. So I'll just show you the kind of four stage model that we came up with. Um, but this kind of helps to explain where where this comes from. So certainly in terms of the phenology that we've got in the UK, um, you've got this stage one, which is um, rhizome activation early in the growing season. and there's also some carb carbohydrate studies as well that were undertaken in lab conditions with pot plants as well. So there, and and larger scale stuff that was done back in the eighties, looking at um, carbohydrate distribution in and and distribution of other uh, photosimilars within above and below ground parts of the knotweed plant um, throughout the growing season. But that was back in the eighties. So we've kind of got all of this information together. Based and, and kind of married that with what we see in under field conditions in the UK to kind of get this, this model together. And you've got this sort of pre-emergence phase where there's rhizome activation following winter dormancy. So you'll kind of, you'll get a sense of it when you're down on site, you know, the, the buds uh, are glowing and ready to go. Um, and then you sort of, yeah, gearing up for your field season really. So around this sort of time in the year, it's been particularly warm this year. I've got a feeling you're probably going to start seeing some emergence over the next, you know, sort of month at most. Um, and those rising resources are going to go um, up into the into the, the shoot buds. And then sort of May, June, that you can see in the green there, so the stage two, um, the flow of resources from the rhizome slows down as it's beginning to acquire resources above ground. And you do see um, a kind of secondary branching pattern developing at that time. The knotweed looks a lot bushier. Um, sort of towards June, um, you get a lot more, you get an increase in leaf area index as well around that sort of time as it hits the, the, the summer maximum growth um, in stage three. And this is where Geth and I were sort of saying June, July, because you do begin to get more of a, because it, the rhizome's transitioning to the sink at this point. What Gethin's been finding is these early, earlier applications, you're actually getting pretty good results with them. So it's, it's that kind of period of time um, that you're getting this transition where you can, you can maximize your glyphosate translocation down into that rhizome system. And then stage four is your optimum, if you, if you like. That's, that's your kind of window that if you 
you know, if you've only got one shot at it, really, you want to be targeting your applications at that time of the year. And I'll, I'll share the materials that I've got for, for this and for Welsh Government as well. But what Geth and I have been finding is that you can get away with application to the knotweed plants up until they've got about 50% of the green leaves on the, on the plant. Um, as long as there's enough pump, because I would imagine, yeah, the, the way that the glyphosate's working in these rhizome forming plants is that the leaves and stems are effectively the pump, which is pushing that glyphosate down into the apical mera stems. So, yeah, that's that's kind of your, your optimal um, point of application. Um, and yeah, you know, while, while you've got that um, big above ground growth and you've got that push down into the into the rhizome system, that's where you, you kind of maximize your translocation. But I mean, what I'm kind of getting at is in terms of what you'd be dealing with in the sort of the Northwest or not the Northwest, the, the Midwest is that you've got this, um, you've got a much more restricted stage four, basically. I would, I would imagine it's going to get colder for you quicker, isn't it? You, it's going to flower and then go into rapid senescence, I'd imagine. I, do, I, I, I wouldn't pretend to be an expert. I've only been to Minnesota once. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, that was during the summer. But I would imagine you, you get colder winters than we do. We're, we're an oceanic climate, aren't we? We've got the Gulf Stream and that. So we get mild, wet winters um, and increasingly mild as well, obviously, with ch climate change. So. Did that answer the question? <laughs> um, so the yeah. flowering is around in August. Is that when it starts to you see full bloom in, in your areas? Yeah, I think July, August, yeah. Okay. That, that sort of time. Yeah, it, 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 the onset becomes apparent in, in July, but August and yeah. September, you'd expect to see it in sort of fairly full flower, but it, but it's Again, depending on what sort of season we're having, you know, you can still see, you know, you'll still find plants, you know, at, at the top end of our uh, sort of altitude range in the, the areas that we're working in, still flowering into November. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dan, one well, the things you're describing for this source sink kind of thing is there one thing that people talk about it's just such a huge plant depending on what kind of equipment you have it's hard to get it sprayed so the you'll do there some Mark Rand's a colleague in Wisconsin neighboring state did some work on clipping they would cut it simply to get to manage that that growth so they could get a better spray application in the fall uh, so you're, you're kind of resetting that source sink and slowly driving it down but do you see any things that kind of that a cutting tied into this simply from being able to manage the size of that plant and well, the things you're describing? Well, I, I, I absolutely agree with how they're feeling about it because yeah, when you, it's quite intimidating. Like you, you've got your spray license, you think, right, okay. So I'm gonna start spraying five hectares of knotweed. And then you sort of actually get there on the day and you've got a 20 liter knapsack sprayer. And, and you're thinking, well, where do you even begin with this? And uh, you know that that it is, and it's it's a real thing. I mean, it's 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 huge. So, in there's there's sort of a number of elements to this. So, um, in terms of cutting, because because the above ground parts of the plant are, are so they're essential in order to 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 move the photosimilate and the glyphosate down into the rhizome. If you cut them, you significantly reduce the efficacy of the glyphosate. Um, however. You know, getting, I mean, we you've got to knock paths through it, haven't you? I mean, you, yeah. you've got to have access to the knotweed, but what what we use is um, a sand, well, a standard knapsack sprayer with a two meter long lance attachment. And I think the kind of key thing that I began to understand as you spray the knotweed is you don't have to spray the whole thing to the point of runoff. You, you're only spraying a small, a handful of the leaves on each stem. So I think off the top of my head, it's about 200 leaves per knotweed plant in full maturity. It's that sort of number. So you don't need to spray it onto all of those leaves. You need to get maybe 10, 15 of them with a decent splash across them, you know, almost to the point of runoff. And the way I'll, I'll, I'll provide some diagrams on like how I did it down at the site, but 
you just sort of break these larger blocks up with the pads and then you just make sure that you've got that reach over that you've got the two meter reach and um, you can spray into the canopy you've got the paths that you can move away from so you, you sort of spray backwards through them so it's, it's quite like once you've got the logistics of it down it's quite it's quite a straightforward thing to do isn't it it's like but you you don't initially think that that would be the way to do it I think it's really straightforward, Dell. I think it, 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 it's, really, it's really obvious, but that's because I've done thousands and thousands of hours of it now. Um, and it's it's one of those things, isn't it, where it just doesn't seem complicated at all now. But but to my mind, I, I, I haven't got the resource to go in and cut stands prior to treatment. Um, we're, we're on with, you know, we're, we've got other treatments for, for giant hogweed and, and, and other invasives, and I just don't have the resource coupled to the fact that I think our best results were from when we trialed cut in and stuff I think our best results were from the plant being intact both pre and post treatment and, and like Dan says you know a little bit of site preparation when you arrive you know to cut some access routes through it and, and formulate a plan of how you're going to manage that site or how you're going to tackle that site and I think the big thing for us as well is the fact that we know we're going back in years two three maybe even four or five so you know you haven't you know, I think the, the emphasis on whilst I'd like to be really thorough and get good coverage, um, I'm not hung up on, like Dan said, treating every single leaf because I know I'm going back to do retreatments in, in year two, three and probably four or five, really. So, I mean, sort of question to everybody then, I mean, how much because, you know, part of the reason that I just said Pacific Northwest or almost did was because when I started with the work, I was sort of looking at, there's quite a lot, is it Sandy River? Um, was one of the projects up in Pacific Northwest. I think that was in Oregon. Um, and there's a couple of projects, King County being one of them in Washington, where they've done a lot of knotweed management. And that was in, in part with uh, Monsanto. So Monsanto would be providing the actives for them to do the testing. So, I mean, I did see quite a few American projects when I started the PhD. So that I think those were maybe 10, 15 years old, those projects. But I mean, how much knotweed management is, is ongoing in America now? And I mean, I know that in, in America, as I understand it, you've still got a Mazap here and you've got Piclorum as well registered for use for, for knotweed. I mean, you've got more tools than we have as well. I mean, that. That was a key limitation of the, the the kind of the study that I did was that um, I couldn't I couldn't access a mazapir and then halfway through the this particular research project um, piclorum was banned so I mean I mean how much not weed management goes on and what what are the key management methods as as it stands certainly where where you you guys are based. Yeah, I mean, so it's really starting to, and everybody chime in as needed. Uh, for us in the Midwest, it's just really been coming, um, it's, it started making its move up in the Northeast and the, and the Southeast parts of Minnesota and becoming a, a, a problem that needed treatment. And for us, Tordon actually was, has, it, it was the mainstay for Spurge for decades. And it was the original picolinic acid that came out of Dow at that time. And uh, for us, it's, it's banned east of the Mississippi. Mississippi goes through the center of Minnesota, but they consider us west of the Mississippi as far as that goes. But we're, we're uh, and it is extremely effective on, on, a, on a screen that I did, um, uh, but it, it has a lot of, of uh, regulatory pushback. And for us, it's the persistence in the aquifers that causes some pretty significant problems. So they, um, the things, I don't know if you have amino pyrrolid, which is marketed as milestone in the US. Uh, that's something that some people uh, like Monica and some of the, the Department of Ag folks have been using very effectively that would have traits kind of like Tordon, but, and it's a subset of the species that Tordon controls and it looks like it's very effective on knotweed. So that's one potential. You looked at the uh, I see, which is starring here in the US. That's part of that same, evolution of those chemistries but um and they are doing more control as you say in the northeast there was a one a milestone paper out of the oregon state people where they it was a more of an extension kind of a publication uh, so you haven't seen a lot of 
things reported in the referee journals, but more so an extension or King County kind of bulletins of what they're finding for control. For us, a Mazapir habitat or arsenal is sold as habitat and the aquatic system works very well, but it has uh, some big gun issues. <laughs> you know, uh, We tend to have small patches in the Midwest as well. Uh, they're not the, the big patches that, that you worked on in some of your studies. Uh, we tend to have smaller patches that are broken up and so forth. So you could do spot treatment kind of things. That's where my, uh, the habitat arsenal would fit well. And it has that soil residual to help pick off some of the straggling rhizomes and things. But for us, when, and glyphosate has always been around, it's got some even more so heightened pushback because of the lawsuit litigation things going on uh, with that. Um, but glyphosate is probably one of the lesser, it will do it, but it's not as efficacious as some of the things like, uh, like Tordon would be, or a tripopyr, which is sold as Garlon here, or a milestone, the aminopyrrolid, that whole picolinic acid group. And then uh, the imidazinones, uh, the arsenal looked really good, the arsenal habitat and mazapyr. It'd be good to have a chat separately with you about this because um, we've, we've got another paper coming out um, on winter heliotrope, which is, they've changed the name of it. They've been changing a lot of the, the names of things recently. Um, yeah. I, I'll, I'll find the paper, but um, it's a smaller rhizome system and the plant is smaller. But one of the things that we did with that was try a whole range of different synthetic organs on it. And I think um, I don't know, I, your garlon and things, I think they've got a higher concentration of active ingredient in them than, than we've, we're allowed anymore. And I think what, the, the way that I've sort of thought about things is that these meristems that are knocked out really effectively with the glyphosate or relatively effectively with the glyphosate, it's quite a long lasting effect on the meristem. Whereas now with the active ingredients that we've got available in terms of the synthetic organs, because they're so, um, the, the concentration of active in them is so low and the application rate is also very low. It just sort of deforms the meristem and then it recovers. Whereas previously with the, the tool dog, because you could apply it at, um, it was 12 liters per hectare. I can't, I can't think how many kilos it is, but it's, it's a lot of kilos of, of picklerin and it would just burn out those meristems in close contact. Um, so I think, we're, we're dealing with a, a really reduced toolbox as well. I think the actives that you've got, like the, the, the synthetic organs, they're coming at a higher concentration and product use rate, and that allows you to, to do more with them, I think. I think there is an element of that as well. Uh, yeah, the... Um... Yeah, it's very dependent. I think no matter what you do, you probably got to do some mop-up operations, you know, whether you do whatever you do. <laughs> uh, but uh, the odd thing about that, the oxen group in particular, the that Tordon group is that they, they seem to be able to move down to those underground metabolic points earlier in the life cycle. We use those very, very effectively in Canada thistle, which has a smaller but a very aggressive underground uh, lateral system. And those things will give you respectable control at the bud stage or, or slightly before even when that carbohydrate shift hasn't quite fully occurred yet. Whereas glyphosate doesn't work that well anyway, but it works abominably poorly <laughs> at that stage. Uh, it just doesn't move uh, as well. So they seem to have the ability to move a little more effectively against, not against, but when there's very little uh, that flow of carbohydrates down to those underground metabolic sites um, compared to things uh, like glyphosate. Uh, but those even in the other systems with these lateral spreading perennials, they, they, are, they are more consistent and more effective at lower rates in the fall because you just get better movement. But they can do it earlier. And that's what I wonder why they, they maybe have a little better results in something is like the knotweed, uh, where they can just move a little more. None of these things get very much material, as you probably know down, there's very little of the material that actually gets to those active sites, but that's just, the, that's the way they, they are. But what little does get there can be more effective in the fall. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you do see it, like you spray one side of a fence with, um, well, the old garland, 
and you'd see the knotweed, the, the symptomology in, in, in neighboring properties, because it would, it would just go through the rhizome system, you know, and, and it was almost instant as well. Within 24 hours, you'd, you'd kind of see that symptomology developing in neighboring plants that hadn't been sprayed, you know, maybe meters away from, from the point of application. It does. It's, it's very, with, I wish you'd have tricked a bit of Dan. It's the recovery, isn't it? Like you get that result within 24 hours, but it doesn't really have that long term effect, does it? The following season, it's back to exactly like it was, really. You could see what use rates um, you folks can use and, yeah, have, a, have a, a chat about the, the chemistry and things. And it would be really interesting. I mean, if you've got examples, I've never actually seen um, the symptomology from um, the milestone applications. I've, I've, I've only ever really heard about it like sort of second hand um, and I'd be really interested to see you know what how it disrupts the growth you know what, what it looks like after you treated it for example. What, what sort of scale Roger the infestations what sort of sizes would the would a typical sort of infestation be? So it'd be a few meters we don't uh, but you got you folks on boots on the ground pipe in but I guess uh, it's we don't on your paper, Dan, you had that what we call a football size field of Dawi, which just from a weed scientist view of the world was just a beautiful site <laughs> that you could go in and play in. Uh, we don't have those kind of expansive populations yet. Uh, it tends to be patchy, and it, it, but it is patching along riparian areas. And Laura, you're on, you know, you might have better insights as to what we're seeing along the areas that DNR manages. But um, uh, for the time being is was patchy. You get a clone started and it starts to entrench and you get this really aggressive patch, but we don't see it trailing along broad expanses, expanses of, of, of land area. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can uh, add a little bit to that. Um, I did a lot of boots on the ground this last mm -hmm. summer and Roger's correct. Uh, most of these infestations are very small, very treatable, which is uh, where smothering came in um, to use in addition to some herbicide. And it kind of helped with um, using less herbicide than uh, without smothering. Um, and was also made treatment for landowners more acceptable. There were some that I would meet with who were a little bit nervous about using chemicals on their property. And so by using smothering as a method, they were a lot more amenable. Um, however, there were some sites that I visited where smothering was simply not an option just because of how big it was. So there were a couple, I'm actually trying to dig up some of those photos now um, I could share, um, but we used milestone as well to treat with herbicide. Um, and we saw some really good results with that also. But yeah, I'm gonna look for those photos because I think there was a couple of sites where it was pretty interesting how big the infestation was. I think it's it's good in the sense that the the knotweed issues that you've got at the moment are currently quite fragmented and one of the things, because the, there was um, a big government inquiry at the start of 2019 into knotweed. And one of the things that came out of it was that we needed to have a, another look at knotweed and whether we, our equivalent of your noxious weed legislation, we've got quite um, uh, stringent um, legislation to stop the movement of waste and um, knotweed material um, without, without appropriate permitting and things like that. But one of the things that is, it, the UK's got quite a unique history in the sense that we industrialised quite rapidly at the same time that we were bringing knotweed in. And then after the Second World War, we deindustrialized and the knotweed was already here and then it got spread around a second time. And we also, because we're an island, we don't have a lot of topsoil like you guys do. You know, you've got expand, you don't have to move soil in the same way that we do. So we're quite far along the invasion curve relative to the date of introduction. Whereas I think there's a lot of areas of North America um, and, and Europe that they're quite far behind our, our kind of curve, if you like. And I think it is good that, like, I think one of the things that I tried to get across in this government report was that, you know, learn from our mistakes. Because like, 
Britain's done a lot of stuff, well, a lot of stuff wrong, but I mean, in, particularly with the, the, the kind of the way that the knotweed has been managed over time, you know, it's, um, if this could have been optimized at an earlier date and like standard methods used, you know, it would, it would have saved a lot of time and money and effort in the longer term. Um, and I think, you know, the, the fact that you've got small stands, you know, that are going to be far easier to manage as they are, I think is, is a positive thing. Yeah, definitely. Okay. When, you, when you look at us, we're just like a, a giant land reclamation scheme in the South Wales Valleys, aren't we? From heavy industry, mining and that sort of stuff. It's just large scale soil movement over, you know, the, the entire region, isn't it? And combined with the way our rivers work, we've got sort of short spate rivers uh, that come up and move an awful lot of water really quickly, eroding the banks and, and washing that rise of material downstream to that loud. Um, it, it, it's like the perfect storm almost, isn't it? Yeah, we may be on the cusp of that perfect storm, I guess, with it starting to move along those areas. Uh, historically, those patches have been in areas where people are, and they see it, then you can manage it. But this movement along uh, other areas, like riparian areas, and you get that fragmentation of moving downstream, we could, you know, you could start to see more larger scale challenges to do that, uh, control that. Do you have, has anybody looked at using a, a the aerial applications with some of the robotics, some of the remote control units on for us with these patches and then accessibility and the height of the plant. I uh, wonder if you could use some of those ultra low volume application remotes and get any kind of results. I was on the way. We've got nothing approved in the UK for, for aerial application other than uh, Azilox for Bracken. Um, so we we that they won't let us do anything like that at all. I might be wrong, Dan, but that's my understanding. Uh, no, the, the, only, the only product that we've got is, um, yeah, Azulog, so that's a carbonate for Bracken, which is a, a fern. I, I don't know whether you guys get it, but um, yeah, over large sort of areas, upland areas, isn't it? and it's approved specifically for that, but they're really reluctant to use aerial applications of anything else at all. I did, there's no reason that it wouldn't work, um, it's just, uh, yeah, the, I've, I've not seen any, any movement either in terms of that being um, approved for regulation. For us, some of our giant hogweed spraying would lend itself really well to some of the robotic sort of drug type stuff. But um, yeah, as far as I'm aware, there's, there's no plans for anything like that at all. Yeah, we do have Bracken in Northeast Minnesota. Um, it's been here for a long time. It is a challenge for some of the grazing systems to have Bracken in there. We, we rely on your, your guys' research in part of, for how to manage that one as well. But. Now, I was curious if the drones with that large canopy and you are spraying the tips, I guess, and if you get late enough this season, it might work. Um, it's that thing about you know, when the good old days, we did a lot of radio tracer work for all those herbicides and where the metabolic sites are is where they go. And uh, if you're top of the canopy and that's where, most, if any, that's where the stuff is going to go to the reproductive areas. But if you get past that phase, then you can maybe get enough translocation down. But on a plant that size, I, I was just curious if anybody's had any experience of just spraying the very tops. You had mentioned that, Dan, on, on the coverage, you know, it's such a large canopy volume, you wouldn't want to try to wet it all, but if you could just spray the tips manually with some of those, did it work? Well, what we, what uh, Gethin and I do, um, and other contractors that we work with, so you kind of, you do, you do an overspray, so that's just over the top of the canopy and over the front of the canopy, and then you put the lance into the canopy, twirl the, I've, I've not got technical words for this. <laughs> you twirl the lance around a little bit and then you move on a bit and do that. And you just literally, that that's all you do. And then when it comes to you, this would be easier to explain with a diagram that I don't have one to hand, but you work out which way the wind's going. And obviously you shouldn't be spraying in high wind, but you can use the wind um, to, to kind of move the spray through the canopy as well so depending on which way the wind's going um you can kind of adjust your position and it just sort of drifts down through the canopy 
Um, so you, you're not, you, you're really only giving it a dusting, aren't you? I mean, it's not, I, you know, I, I thought, and this kind of comes back to the original kind of how I sort of was panicking the first times that I was doing it. I was thinking, oh, there's no way that I'm getting on enough herbicide here, but you are. Because, and, and this is definitely in the paper, it's, I, it's right down at the bottom, but this, it, it's because of the strength of the meristems in the knotweed plant and just the way that the glyphosate seems to settle out following application within different, um, and the, the, the variant tissue strengths at certain times of the year. It does, considering how, how little effectively that you're applying to the knotweed plant, when you compare the foliar application with the stem injection or the cut and fill, which are using you know, vastly more herbicide, you, you're getting similar treatment outcomes, which is just, I'd, and I think, you know, when you're sort of looking at the size of the plant, you know, um, like my, my preconceptions about managing it using, you know, a lot of auxins, a lot of the other chemicals and thinking, you know, it's all about, you know, just steamrolling it, basically, just sort of get rid as quickly as possible and, and get something else to, it doesn't, it didn't seem to work like that. Um, certainly in terms of the application rates. I mean, the foliar application rate that Geth uses is 3.6 kilos acid equivalent. When you spray at half rate, it was about four kilos acid equivalent per hectare. And then you've got these stem injection application rates and things that are being put directly into the rhizome effectively. And they're, they're performing no better than those, which is, you know, and I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and obviously I can share I think it's the Sidera and Duke paper and the Feng et al. 2003. I'll find these papers for you, um, but it's, it's really quite interesting, you know, how, it, how it's broken down or moved around in, inside the plant, you know? Yeah, the injection is kind of fascinating, but uh, in a sense, it's, it's just not the kind of structures for the glyphosate to move into the simplast there. But the, and if you overload certain areas, you can damage the cells enough and, and defeat your purpose, you know, trying to get into the simplex to get that translocation to the metabolic sites. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So the 80s was uh, still uh, very high priced glyphosate and we were trying to drive rates down in my Monsanto days and it's very effective on Graminaceae, more so than dicots. Uh, so we're driving ultra low rates for us at the time to get quack grass, which isn't even the Celotrius now, it was an agropion repens um, at the time. That was the big challenge. And you could you do seasonality, kind of seasonal treatments, and we use these fractionable rates that would control it, kind of sublethal rates. And if you put them on in, in, for that plant in June, July, uh, the translocation went and blew the flowers right off the plant, but you hardly even browned the tissue because that's where the metabolic site was. And you did those same sublethal quote unquote rates in the fall and you got complete kill of that. That's a shallow, not as aggressive of a rhizome system. So it's easier to knock it out, but it would just owes to that where the metabolic sites are and where the material can go. And if you can dry that application late enough in the season, even getting the tops, I wonder where you're getting more superficial out, outer areas of the canopy covered, if you could still get reasonable results of just dealing with that massive of a structure. For us, the movement really goes in earnest towards in September, it's got a small window, and then it, it's one of the first to go when we get our light frost. That's just not very frost hardy compared to some other herbaceous plants. Um, so we're looking at carbohydrates. We've been sampling some populations every month and we haven't run them through the lab yet to see what they are, just trying to get a handle on that when the movement and to the degree of movement into the, the rhizome system during the season uh, to try to tie to that herbicide timing a little yeah. more tightly. Definitely. That's interesting though. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it'd be interesting to see how it differs as well. From, from UK research, but I mean, there's, I'd, I'd be happy to share what we've got um, on all of this stuff. I mean, do, do you folks do much of the restoration then, or is it is it sort of active management and then just passive recolonization by native plants? In terms of like endpoints or end goals of, of the management program, is there, I mean, how long are these programs funded for? 
you know, mm -hmm. if, if you're undertaking management in a river catchment, how long are you likely to be funded for that? Joel, you have any comments or? <laughs> well, yeah, so. He's the guy that does it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how we get funding is through um, grants from the Department of Agriculture. Um, and with that money is how we pay for like treatment, resources, supplies, um, time for people to go out and do that work and eventually at least the grants and the funding that i've used um there's no like set goal for like the entire thing so it's not about treatment and then following up with restoration it's just kind of like a sum of money to use for treatment and then once it runs out you just apply for more um but Again, going back to what we kind of mentioned before is a lot of these um, infestations are so small um, and often uh, just not large enough to warrant like large scale restoration effort um, that at least for myself, that was not something that we worked on uh, at all and is kind of uh, just following up and making sure that treatment is uh, going smoothly and um, is being effective. Um, so no, I don't, don't know too much about the restoration efforts, but I actually do have, I found those photos that I mentioned. Um, I can give you a little window um, into what we had going on. Um, let's see. So. This was a small patch of Japanese knotweed that was along a public trail um, up in the northwest corner of the Twin Cities. Um, and this was back in June when I took this photo. And so it wasn't flowering yet, so we didn't do any spraying of herbicide. And what I ended up doing was um, cutting it down and smothering it. Um, and so after I did that, um, I came back in the fall and there was some minor growth along the edge just there, um, which was then treated with herbicide. Um, and so that was that one. But now here is, this was the yard of a lady's house. Um, so th there was so much knotweed I couldn't get it all into one picture. So this is like one side of it. And it like, it, so it comes like all the way around. It kind of does like a circle around the property um, and goes even further back down there and was beginning to creep up onto her neighbor's yard. Um, and then within there, I mean, it was the infestation was like something like 10 feet thick um, with more plants dispersed um, throughout the property um, inside. Um, so there's some more photos of the area inside and then more on the outside. But I suppose I'm wondering. Um, in the UK, what is the public perception like on Japanese knotweed here? Because that was something I worked with a lot um, and like trying to educate and explain like what this is to people and how we treat it and what to do and how to identify it. Because again, these infestations are so small that, I mean, the average person here just doesn't really know um, about the plant at all. Um, and when I was, working on you know, kind of putting this thing together, um, the checking out knotweed in the United Kingdom and how it's treated there because of how extensive some of these infestations are is really what sent me down that rabbit hole. So I'm really curious to hear about that from Gethin, uh, Dan and Sophie. 
So from my perspective, I think that in the, the period of time that I've been involved in it, I think the public perception has increased massively. I think partly in the UK that's because of the effect of um, the, the, the issue sort of from about 2008, 2009, uh, of it affecting people, uh, um, people getting mortgages. So the property that you show, that would be identified during a, a property survey. Um, and then that, that would render that property probably unmortgageable, if that, that's the term. Um, so that the mortgage companies would want a treatment plan put in place prior, prior to them lending on that property. And I think as a consequence, that's been, you know, that gets flagged up in the media here pretty often. It's, you know, if you have a quick Google search, you'll be able to find numerous articles in local papers, national newspapers, where, where not weeds affected people's house prices and that sort of stuff. And I think as a consequence of that, um, like I said, in the, the time that I've been involved in, in invasive species, uh, it's raised people's awarenesses massively, uh, people's awareness massively in the UK. Uh, and I think, you know, it's nothing for us to get sort of three, four hundred inquiries a year from concerned homeowners, landowners, that sort of stuff on control methods. Uh, and I think that's where perhaps when we, we would experience perhaps a little bit of a pushback in terms of herbicide application. I think once people have it affecting properties and perhaps the, the largest investment that, that they might make, uh, they seem to be a bit more sort of uh, a bit keener to get good results and good results quickly. Really. I think probably the other thing, Dan, for us to touch on is is the fact that with with your work as well, we we've got to be seeing uh, this quite a strong sort of uh, situation with neighbouring landowners uh, taking litigation uh, action against each other, uh, and we've got to be seen to be doing what what's considered best practice in terms of our control methods. So I mean, without wanting this to come across, I mean, basically, there's three of these methods work. I trial. 19 <clears throat> and like there's three of them that i recommend um and coming back to what Gath just said about how things work in the uk so if you've got not weed on your land and it grows on someone else's land um that's that's a, in a legal term called encroachment and if that not weeds encro encroaches on someone else's land potentially they can take you to court if you've acted negligently in allowing that not weed to grow onto their land so the reason that I'm saying this is because solicitors are very good at words and they quickly get a grasp of what you're saying in terms of your research. And some of the results that we got in terms of the, the, the outcomes of the research suggested that um, over application of glyphosate didn't produce better results, which was quite counterintuitive based on the size of the plant. Um, things like covering and cutting, well, well, just do cutting for uh, for starters. Cutting reduces that that pump action, so you get um, less of the herbicide, the glyphosate-based herbicide, taken down to the root system late in the growing season. So I don't recommend that. And because if someone's done that, it it can also spread the plant because parts of the knotweed plant can can reroot, can they can spread. But also if you cut or cover knotweed, it tends to grow away from the disturbance. So if, for example, we've got somebody cutting their knotweed down and um, probably there's, there's an incident um, in, in Gethins County Council at the moment where a lot where knotweed's been cut over a long period of time and it's begun to, to grow away from the point of cutting. You know, this is this is a thing that happens quite frequently here and covering can also do this. So. When I recommend these methods, I appreciate that people might not want to use herbicides, but particularly when it comes to legal issues, if you don't use one of these glyphosate based methods, you might encourage lateral spread and um, you could spread the knotweed further by cutting the plant down. So this is this is kind of where we've got to with 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 the, the knotweed treatment methods that we use. And I think while on one hand, you know, I do as an ecologist appreciate that people don't like herbicides when there's so few methods to manage it effectively i mean there's an argument that i've made quite recently quite a lot of times that you'd be better off doing nothing than treating it with the wrong thing geth i think I mean, for us dan i think for us dan our our biggest thing is resource i just haven't got the resource to go around and do anything else if that makes sense uh, we have to maximize our our results and get the best the best bang for our buck if you like and get the best results from what we've got available to us and that's the the, 
the, the application of glyphosate between, let's say, at, at the optimum times of the year. But it, certainly from, from my experience, when you see cutting, you can certainly encourage that lateral spread. Um, and the, the, the site that we've been looking at, or the site that Dan's been looking at with us, uh, I think the lady suggested she's been cutting it for about 40 years, Dan, hasn't she? I, and, but this, this comes back to a point that Sophie made when we were doing the winter heliotrope uh, paper, right? These plants, and I can't remember who said it, it's a bit like the Fantasia effect where he's chopping, um, Mickey Mouse is chopping up the, the wooden broomstick and it just turns into lots of little pieces and then starts spreading off, right? Like these plants, like they're by design, they're designed to be fragmented and spread. Like that's, that's the, their primary mode, certainly in the UK, where it's clonal dispersal. That's their like primary mode of spread. And the other thing is that, I think from, I don't know, uh, habitat restoration approach, but just sort of getting something useful back in, in the place of the knotweed. If you don't remove the knotweed, which is the primary invasive, the, the, the competitive dominant invasive plant in that setting, you want to get rid of it as quickly as possible to allow other things to grow there. And some of these methods, particularly things like covering, you know, because I, I tested covering with, with, with the main paper and I think I, I, I had it in place for about seven years. And as soon as you remove the covering treatment, well, certainly on the big patch that I was using, um, it, it just it just sprung back up again. As soon as the, 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 the light returns to the, the knotweed, there was no long-term control effect of having that covering in place. So like, it's, it, you know, maybe on the smaller patches it might work, but coming back to the kind of central thing, you know, the scale that we're working at here, things have got to work at, at large scale as well as small scale. And I think when you think about sort of treatment sustainability and, you know, using public money and things like that, you know, you've got to consider, well, yeah, you've, you've got to have conversations with people and say, look, you, we're not, we're not using this on a, on a widespread basis. We're not, we're not using it at the wrong time of the year. We're not over applying it even, you know, we're, we're, we're being sustainable in our approach here. And actually, you know, when Sophie's research comes out, it's another thing to point to, you know, there's other considerations in this. When you think about sustainable management, it's not just, have you used glyphosate or not? It's like overall over, you know, a five, 10 year management program, how much carbon have you used? How many carcinogens have been, been released into the environment? What's the labor cost? You know, how much plastic's been used? These are all kind of, they, well, they should all be part of the decision-making mechanism. And I do appreciate that it, it's hard conversations to have with people because, yeah, people don't like the use of herbicides and particularly glyphosate. But by the same measure, you know, if, if there's very few other things that work very well for it, it's, it's you know, there is no magic bullet for not weed management that I can see. And I mean, you know, we've, we've tried a lot of different stuff on it. Um, but glyphosate gives you decent results and, you know, in a, in a reasonable space of time as well. It's that perception as well, Dan, isn't it? That, that, you know, the initial herbicide application might be quite extensive, but when it comes to years two, three, and, and, and on from there, it's spot spring individual plants that, you know, where you had that dense monoculture, if you like, in, in year one, uh, you're down to perhaps you know, a, a, a single plant in, you know, 10, 15 square meters in year two or three or whatever. So it's it's a lot less herbicide that applied in, in those subsequent years. Uh, and you, you can see from the, you know, just the anecdotal stuff that we've done in terms of, you know, site records and whatever, that, that quite quickly you do get some uh, site restoration, you know, for, from, you know, even if you, you don't do anything actively, you know, even that passive restoration can sometimes be okay, can't it? Yeah, and so I just want to jump in and quickly say that this kind of what you were saying, Geth, and kind of just drives home the fact that we really need long term thinking. It can't just be kind of we'll spray it this year and then go away and that's it. You need to be coming back every year and checking on what's happening. What happens when you cover the knotweed? What happens when you're spraying things off? Are other things growing back? Or yeah, we, we just need that long term thinking when it comes to Japanese knotweed. I'm curious, what is the beast that you guys are wrestling with? We've always, you know, over the years and daily kept documenting the clonal nature of it, but do you have the things, so Dallas is still on, Neil probably had to go teach class or something like that, but the genetics are interesting and the seed potential for asexual reproduction and spread by seed gives you a whole nother pathway to worry about and 
what what do you guys have in England now? Is it do you have like this complex, or is it still pretty much Japonica? Or so the main um, plant that we have is just the Japonica, and it's the entire Japanese knotweed clone that we have in the UK is a single female clone. We do have other hybrids, but they were introduced kind of separately, and they do kind of hybridize, um, but not to such a big extent. Um, but we do get Japanese knotweed producing seeds in the UK, um, but those are primarily um, crossed with a plant called Russian vine. So that's Fallopia bolschwanica. Um, so those seeds, they are viable. Um, so if you collected them and you know grow them in a plant pot, they will grow, um, but they don't survive our winters. So because we have these kind of mild wet winters, they're not because they're an intergeneric hybrid, the endosperm is very weak, so they don't tend to survive in the wild. Um, um, yeah, so at the moment it's just basically vegetative spread um, with our female clone. But yeah, there's no telling really what's going to happen in, in the future with climate change and things like that, and whether we're going to get a new kind of Connolly's knotweed um, invasion in the UK. I don't know if Dan, you've got anything else to add to that or? Yeah, I mean, there is potential for is a back crossing my genetics isn't the best um and it is it's quite a confusing hybridization complex as well um but yeah we, the the majority of ours is the is the sort of standard knot we we get a fair bit of bohemian knot we don't we like up in the valleys and that and and then sort of sparse areas of um giant knot weed and then we also get dwarf knot weed which is variety compactor um, but we only get little bits and pieces of that, they're, you know, small patches. But coming back to what you folks were saying about um, having small patches, the, the ones that are kind of isolated and left to their own devices and not cut or, you know, sprayed with different things and just sort of left to their own devices, they don't spread a huge amount. It's the ones down in the riparian settings where they're, you know, sort of flushed with flood water or you know, in areas that people have been undertaking a lot of management. Um, those are the kind of areas where things have spread. Roadside flailing of vegetation is a key one, I think, personally. Um, you know, where knotweed stands have been flailed um, with the chains and things on the side of the tractor, that those those stands get quite big quite quickly. Um, For us as well, then, we've got, with the way the, the geography is with our valleys, we've got sort of steep sided valleys and everything is, is sort of concentrated into the bottom. So roadside verges tend to have sort of uh, infrastructure, pipelines, uh, cables, that sort of stuff pushed through. So it tends to be lots of disturbance as well that drags them through. So that combined with the flailing is always an absolute nightmare. Isn't it? If you think about, you know, the natural habitat of Japanese knotweed growing on volcanic soils and things like that, it does kind of make sense that areas of high disturbance is going to stimulate knotweed growth. Yeah, it, definitely. Yeah, that, uh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it, it's 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 very pre well pre adapted, isn't it? Pre adaption is, you know, it's 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 got all of the kind of key features of resilience and propagation and then you know it's it's got this enormous growth above ground that just means that it's got absolutely no competition and that certainly in the UK you know because people have tried shading it out by putting tree plantings in amongst the knotweed patches and things like that but I mean all of these larger knotweed stands there's nothing in there other than knotweed once they reach maturity and all of the mature plants have died you don't get any more seedlings. The only three species that we get in there are um, Aerum maculatum, which is like um, basically they're all vernal species, the ones that you know have completed their life cycle before the knotweed canopies gaps close it. So we've got um, bluebells and, and lords and ladies, which is this Aerum, um, and then bindweed that grows over the top of the knotweed. And that they, those are the only three species that commonly co-occur with it. Um, you know, certainly in the larger stands, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's quite mm. remarkable stuff, really. It is really interesting. I'm really interested in, like, functional traits and things like that. And to think of it from a functional perspective, you know, how this knotweed just completely shifts the ecosystem from a diverse, you know, range of functional traits to just these perennial um, rhizome forming species or, you know, species with corms and things like that. 
it's just all of these perennial vernal species. Um, yeah, that can spread vegetatively, nothing that can spread by seed. It, it makes sense on it's a herbaceous perennial, but disturbance is adapted to those disturbance events. And some other perennials kind of started our weed science societies in the US. Uh, the convolvulus, the, the bind weeds were a species that was very adapted to the tilling prairies, you know, and planting crops. It just, it before herbicides, it drove people out of business, literally. And that's why they, uh, <laughs> that was a one, that's our poster child weed for, for weed science. Um, in the U.S., but the uh, uh, so it makes sense that disturbance-driven system just it really it can take advantage of that and and wreak havoc. <laughs> we have a I put a spread plot out just out of curiosity. I just stuck a bohemian in the center of a big open area and we're watching it spread and it's pretty disappointing, quite frankly. Just left to its own devices, it's not it's not doing very much to impress me. Um, but I, I think what you're describing, particularly our riparian areas, are set to maybe be larger expanses uh, fairly quickly if, if those satellite populations aren't taken care of. Uh, Dallas, would you mind giving a little synopsis of the, what, we, what you're finding on the genetics and the hybrids and seed potential for seed spread? If you don't oh, mind. Sure. Yeah, again, like I said, I wasn't prepared to talk about my research at all, but I mean, obviously I know it because it's what I do every day. Yeah, so definitely what we see here in Minnesota, what we found with our genetic studies is definitely that the hybrid bohemian is the most prevalent of the taxa here in Minnesota. And we also wanted to look at, we were assuming there was probably going to be a lot of misidentifications based on the morphological identification identifications, we thought when we got the genetic data, a lot of them would probably be incorrect. Uh, but actually, we're seeing that not that many were incorrect. And most of the ones that were incorrect were obviously ID'd as Japanese knotweed, but they're bohemian. And we're also seeing diversity for all of the taxa for giant, though we don't have that many giant here. We only had three populations in our genetic analysis. And then obviously Bohemian is very diverse. And then we're also seeing diversity in Japanese, which is pretty unique. And we did an analysis of molecular variants as well uh, to see how variance was distributed. And we're seeing that there is higher variance within populations compared to between populations. And that, that combined with a study that we did on the MLGs and a study of the clonality basically is showing that there is evidence for sexual spread in Minnesota, but definitely asexual spread is still the most predominant. And yeah, that's everything I can think of right now, unless Roger, there's something specific you were wanting me to share. No, that's fine. I think for me, the novelty of the, the potential for seed spread just adds yeah. another layer of complexity to this. Uh, because you just by, by the nature of the pathways of invasion that are going to occur, and given us things to um, to monitor, I guess, and look at more closely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that's interesting is, like I said, we only had one population of giant, at least in our data set, that was identified, and then after we got the genetic information back, we saw oh, there's also another giant population that wasn't ID'd morphologically. So the sexual spread in the bohemian that we have, I guess it's our current assumption right now, obviously this isn't, we don't know this for sure, is probably the result of bohemian crossing with Japanese and lots of bat crossing events because there's not enough giant populations in Minnesota for them to all be giant Japanese crosses. And so that begs the question of her, you know, the herbicide control, we're doing some initial study so far. The giants of WIMP as far as winter kill that goes out really early here compared to the other two. In Bohemian just looks like the most aggressive big plant because uh, giant just doesn't get a chance to do its thing, but it's more lateral in growth. Um, but the, and it's clearly more susceptible to some herbicides. We haven't got stuff through all the cycling of in data analyze and stuff, but just visually it's obvious that it's, it's very susceptible compared to the other two. Um, 
And the bohemian is interesting because it is a hybrid. So uh, the presence of bohemian so widely dispersed in Minnesota is of interest as to our, because we were thinking, well, Japonica, you know, and it's just a clone. Uh, but I think it's going to be a lot more diverse than, than we realize. We also have Compacta planted all over on campus by our land managers. <laughs> and it's right outside the building that I house in. And we had this odd type thing at the student center on our St. Paul remote campus uh, that was just a huge plant. So we dug them up and um, that brought up the questions of is the Compacta, you know, starting to have some off types that are more weedy or was it a seed that got some pollen somehow in the compacta? And so that was a asexual introduction in a big plant that's and it's in the mix of, of things that we're playing with. But um, anyway, so just the, the, the diversity of the plant is, is of interest. And I, I think we might have a lot more, the take home from Dallas's work to me is we had a lot of bohemian, a lot of hybrid already. So a lot of integration of genes that we weren't really expecting to be that common at this point. I remember John Bailey saying, the worst thing that can possibly happen is certainly for the UK is if we get back crossing. Because mm -hmm. our population doesn't have a great deal of diversity in it. And we don't have a great deal of bohemian. But based on what Dallas has said that, yeah, it sounds like it's quite diverse and worryingly diverse and potentially be the back cross, isn't it? By the sound of it, that, that I, I'm, as I said, like based on, based on stuff that I've recently done with John Bailey, I don't, yeah, ours don't sound anywhere near that complicated in terms of the, the genetic side of things. I mean, they, they don't. It would be interesting to see over time what your populations do in the, the UK. Uh, as far as if J your Japonica is so entrenched, it might be hard for other ones to gain a foothold in some respects, whereas we're a more wild west open country for new invasions and some, you know, hybrid can come in and just be the dominant population possibly. I mean, one thing, once not we go somewhere, it doesn't tend to leave. So, yeah, yeah once <laughs> Once we're sort of full up with Japanese knotweed, it's very difficult for that to get displaced, I'd imagine. Whereas, yeah, stuff spreading by seed, you know, genetically diverse seed, that's that's not ideal, particularly in the early stages of the invasion, isn't it? Because, like, at least in the UK, there were identifiable pathways that tended to be associated with anthropogenic processes or riverine processes or whatever it was, so you could kind of see where it was likely to be moving because of this clonal spread. Whereas if you haven't got that and it's, you know, reproducing and spreading sexually, that makes it far more difficult to predict and yeah, plan management around. It's just, it's anecdotal, but when we, when the settlers came and established uh, the agricultural systems in the Midwest, uh, Canada Thistle, Sir Seymour Benzis, was one of the, the major problems that they couldn't deal with, couldn't manage without the herbicides, and it was adapted to tillage. But those initial invasions were clonal. You'd have a male or a female plant, there's a dioecious plant, and you get a male or female and there's this little circle that caused problems. And like in Minnesota, once you got the males and females together and you got that asexual spread, it just covered the whole state, <laughs> really, instead of this slow clonal spread and patchiness, you, you get a uniform full coverage kind of a problem then. Just having additional pathways, but. Mm. Well, it is interesting, the herbicide work you guys are doing, I wouldn't, if you were interested, I wouldn't mind following up with you on, on some uh, aspects of what you're doing. Um, definitely and like I, I in all honesty the three of us went 100% sure how how we would work with this but I mean if 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 you guys want to catch up again and I'm just sort of saying for, for Dallas if she I can put her in touch with well I can put you all in touch with John Bailey who um who's the kind of well the, the the guy that did all of the genetics work to start with on on not we and I'm sure he'd be, if nothing else, interested to hear about the genetic studies that you've been doing. Um, and it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's quite a small, 
I don't know, sort of a group of people that work on it. And it's, it's, it's good to sort of talk to other people now and again, particularly for, well, for the three of us who tend to be uh, out on site and talking to nobody for long periods of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, any, any social interaction is great for you acknowledged. Um, but, yeah, um, it'd, be, it'd be really good to pick up. And um, amongst other discussions, like Gethin's... Um, arranged some field trial sites for me for, for well for last year and, and this year going forward. Um, Sophie and I are, are um, going to be looking at some funding opportunities as well and yeah it'd be I've been interested in it, some other herbicides that might be effective against knotweed so it'd be good to have a catch up with you and sort of see see where there might be some I don't know without using management speak um, I don't know, like uh, synergies or <laughs> whatever the current term is. Um, but yeah, it'd be it'd be good to sort of keep a dialogue open with everything. Yep. Um, and well, so be yeah, let be interested in following up on herbicides. We don't have the beautiful patches that are large enough to do replicated studies to sort out comparative differences. So we've been working on getting established rhizome plants that can regenerate and doing some screens, you know, in pots. And I know all the, the inadequacies of that, but it gives us some indications of things to maybe proof in the field uh, on some of our individual patches. Um, there was some biomass work in England too. Uh, uh, it was a research article where they're looking at different plants for carbohydrates, starch for biomass use, probably a late, I can't remember, a 70s or early 80s. Paper? Callahan at L, yeah, yeah, 1981. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You're not trying to harvest it and just make peace with it and use it to fuel your power plants. And the Germans, the Germans are planting it. There's, oh there's, I'll, I'll dig out the video um, when we, when we correspond. But there's, there's a video, and it's, it's within the last ten years um, of them planting a supposedly um, non-invasive hybrid knotweed. For a biomass crop so it sounds, yeah, it sounds so, like us putting a rondo in san diego for example to that's probably not a good idea but no <laughs> probably not um our, our yeah. sites are too difficult to walk on never mind harvest <laughs> <laughs> there's that as well um but yeah it'd be good to stay in touch and i mean um you know we're we're at a good point in in things at the moment that yeah it'd be it'd be good to start sort of looking at where we could where, where we could work with different people and things but like i've done quite a lot of pot based testing because of the constraints um financial constraints around testing so it'd be good to have a chat with you about that um for some of the commercial companies so i've been doing quite a lot of uh pot based stuff so it'd be interesting having a chat with you because obviously we've got large patches of knotweed but Companies might not have infinite funds to spend on large scale field yeah. trials, so they're they're quite comfortable with um, smaller chunks of rhizome in pot based studies. So, be good to have a chat with you about that. Sure, would like that. Right. Well, cheers for getting us on. Um, I, 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 um, it was it was it was quite a surprise that you got in touch, and yeah, I, it's been nice having a chat about everything. Um, I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but oh, no, you're very welcome. Yeah. The pleasure was mine. I'm very happy that you guys responded and were interested in being here. This was a really good time. Um, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to speak again. Uh, we could maybe do more of these in the future, and I'll absolutely send out an email later today uh, to all of you. Um, you know, with all your emails, and so people can get in touch and things like that. Appreciate it. This right. is great, Joe. Thank you for getting this together, uh, no. hosting. You're yeah, welcome. thank you. Thanks for coming. And for going down yeah, to the Zoom pleasure. level for us people that are Microsoft <laughs> challenged on our university computers. No worries. <laughs> well, we like not weed, not technology so much, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Definitely. Um, well, all right, everyone. You. Thank you all. Appreciate okay, it. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Lovely to Thank meet you. Thanks, Mike.